Is the young of age you dismissed, not young of hearts, or maturity? You'd be left with an empty room. You know, as I didn't, I didn't make another PowerPoint this morning, so there will be no scripture behind me. So if you want to follow along, turn to, I think it's John, I didn't even put the chapter up there. I guess you're not going to be able to follow along, but it's the story of the woman at the well. Samaritan woman at the well. So if you know it, great, turn to it. If not, then you're just going to have to listen to me because I have the microphone. As I was reflecting, it's funny because this has actually turned into a three-part sermon series again, which was not planned, but that's sometimes how God works. I just want to summarize and open up with this one statement that without Christ, we are nothing more than a broken backstory. Without Christ, we are nothing more than a broken backstory. What does that mean? That without Jesus, we are nothing more than the brokenness of yesterday defining our today that will define our tomorrow. But Jesus steps into our story and says, you are more than any pain you've experienced or are experiencing, have been caused, or are causing others. You are more than that. Let me change that. Let me come into your life. It's more than a religion or a faith. It's a relationship and a connection absolutely with Jesus Christ. So I don't know why I didn't write the reference down, but that's, well, probably because I've been dealing with a sick kid. Oh, funny enough. So the day, the day that I, I am visiting my dad because his sister passed away and I wanted to be there for him, I go home that night. I end up puking my guts out to about four in the morning the next morning, which was yesterday. Started to feel a little bit better. And I thought, oh, I'll just get a good night's sleep. I'll step into Sunday morning. Refer- no. My youngest, again, woke me up at about 4 a.m. screaming. So it's just, it's just funny how you plan things out, but nothing ever seems to go according to plan. But God, right? So Jesus gave me the gift of coffee. I use that. I feel good right now. I'm going to crash after the service. But I just feel like it's so funny how maybe this is just me. But in those moments when things aren't going according to our plan, it's very easy to focus on that and lose focus on God. Last night's hockey game, case in point. And if you don't believe in grace and coming as you are, then you've got to take a look at Bob Farstad who walked into our church the way he's dressed. But Jesus loves him. (laughs) And I love you too. Yeah, well, that's fair. As I said, you guys were due, right? So that's good. Now, this is it. This this verse 4. Okay. Reel you back in. That was my fault. Verse 4, is John 4? Thank you. John 4, verse 4. This is the absolute summation because this doesn't make any sense, but it's written here on purpose. Remember, things that are specified in the Bible are there for a reason. Use the Google machine and search why. Now he, he being Jesus, had to go through Samaria. No, he didn't. Why would I say that? Because he's a Jewish man. Now, if you're looking at the nation of where he was and where he was going, north to south, Jesus was on the southern point. The point of his destination where he was actually going to was north. So, path of least resistance and most direct journey would make sense to go in a straight line, right? Unless it runs through Samaria and you're a Jewish man... It was common practice. I mean, it was common and expected of you to be a good Jewish person. You would cross the Jordan River to avoid Samaria and then recross and then continue north. So no, he didn't have to go to Samaria. But what scripture is saying here, he went on purpose. He had to go to Samaria. And then you're supposed to ask yourself, if you're reading this and understanding the cultural context, why? Well, let me tell you. So he came to a town in Samaria, which again, here's Jesus, this radical, radical man who was rejected by his culture and the other religious elite, taking 12 people who had dedicated themselves to becoming like him, his disciples who were like, why are we going this way? Okay? So as a disciple ourselves, we need to go on a journey and understand the workings and the leadings of Jesus Christ more often than not, will not stay within our comfort zones. 
More often than not, we'll not stay within the limitations of what we think he should and should not do, where we think he should and should not lead us, and what we think we should and should not be doing. But as long as we're listening and following the lead of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, that's all that matters. Don't worry about why or how. He's asking us just to simply come as we are and to follow him. And that takes a lot of guts. Because they came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. And this is why Jesus had to go to Samaria. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? I see you there. Can you also please give me something to drink as well? My body needs refreshing. Now, what's interesting is in verse 8, it specifies that his disciples had gone to the town to buy food. Why is this important? Because this wasn't about the people that were already following Jesus. This was about Jesus seeking out those who had not seen, heard, or experienced him. Jesus was operating outside of the normal routines this wasn't about the already followers, it's about the not yet. The Samaritan woman, verse 9, says to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Because Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Like I said, common practice was to go across the Jordan River, which isn't an easy feat 2,000 years ago, go up north a little bit, then head back west to go across again just to regain your journey. But Jesus was there on purpose. He had to go. He had to go. And he arrived. See, and here's the history. Back in the day, the Old Testament, when you had all of Israel separated into several kingdoms, right? The northern kingdom would have been what the Samaritans were. They were overtaken by the Assyrians in about 700 BC. And they actually rejected their heritage to a degree. They gave in to the oppressing force that had invaded and they intermarried with the quote-unquote heathens and the pagans and they adopted their cultures and their worships of these different gods as well. So Israel viewed themselves as the pure Jews said, you are nothing more than half-breeds on your best day. You've forgotten your God and your ways. You are cast out, rejected, condemned. You are dead to us. So from that day forward, the pure Jews, quote-unquote, from Jerusalem would not associate with the Samaritans because they were less than. Now, why do I bring this up? Because I think it's important because I've seen this attitude in a lot of cultures and contexts that it's easy for people who are saved at times to unintentionally view people who don't know Christ when they're walking in sin or brokenness to condemn them and look at them as less than. Oh, if only they knew Jesus like I did. And they always add on that last part, like somehow we're better than other people because of Christ, which is true, but we didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it. Jesus just showed up and we extended the invitation. Therefore, when the disciples went away, Jesus was able to do his work because they probably wouldn't have allowed it or at least discouraged and distracted him from doing it. What I'm saying is there's been times, and even this last week, it's been so strange. Life is so precious. I don't care how famous you are and how much money you have. It does not buy you another moment or day. When your time is up, it's up. I've seen so many people talking about Kobe Bryant, and it was so sad to me that his 13-year-old daughter and then a family that was also in the helicopter died with him. It wasn't just about the famous superstar. It was about this man and his family and how his other kids and his wife were left without them. It's, it's, it breaks my heart. But then I was confronted by someone else who is a Christian, and they said to me, yes, but let's not forget this man is a rapist. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, what? I'm talking about his kid. I'm not talking about something he was accused of 20 years ago. I'm talking about a family that lost a father and a family that lost a daughter. Just... Can we put the focus back? Yes, well, he settled out of court and 
he apologized, but he never owned up. And I think that if a real Christian would have owned up, because Kobe Bryant came to Jesus in the last few years. He was very outspoken about his faith. So, but the thing is, it doesn't matter. Uh, the fact that somebody was there talking to me saying, yeah, but he was this, he did this. I'm like, listen, thank God Christ doesn't look at my sins of my past and judge me by them. Yeah. I said, this is about a family. That, but that, all that focus is, and what I'm trying to say is, she viewed herself through the lens of what she had been told culturally that was acceptable. I am less than you, so you shouldn't be talking to me. So what are you doing? And it obviously struck a chord in her that there's this Jewish man talking to a Samaritan woman. And let's not forget, 2,000 years ago, women were valued less than men. So this was already a hierarchy. She was probably a little ticked off that this Jewish man was almost presuming that she would just bow to his every whim and get water from her well. There is a bit of a, an uncomfortable situation. But Jesus is like, it's good. I love working in the gray. I love mixing up in uncomfortable areas, but I love you, and you have no idea where I'm going with this. And Jesus answered her, and I love this, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, what I love about this is if you look at that whole verse I just talked about, verse 10, if you knew the gift of God, he's not talking in a language that actually means just a gift imparted. He's actually implying it's personal, intimate. If you knew the gift is actually a person, not a thing. If only you knew the one who is the gift of God and is who asks you for a drink, he's telling her, it's me. He's just hinting at it though, right? You would have asked him, not me, him. This is, I'm just talking metaphorically. It's like, have you ever seen movies that guy goes to the doctor and like, uh, doc, I've got this friend, see, and he's got this rash. And I mean, it's everywhere. Not, not me, it's my friend, and he's just too embarrassed to come here. What's his name? Uh, John S Smith. My friend John Smith, he's got this rash, and it's just, it's just uncontrollable, and it just itches and burns and oozes. And Anyway, what can you do for him, right? This is kind of what Jesus is doing. He, he's basically saying, if only you knew. But he's not even giving it to her that directly. He's easing her into it. Why? Because she's uncomfortable with a Jewish man standing before her. Why am I bringing this up? It's because when Jesus steps into our story, when we need him the most, it's probably going to be the time when we don't know we need him the most, and we might be so discombobulated, even though we are Christians and we love Christ, that we might not be able to recognize his slow intersection of our mess and chaos. And he will do it slowly in a way that will help us embrace and hear him. Why? Because he loves us. He doesn't just show up and van damn the door open in front of him and say, Yeah! Unless that's the way we need him to. But what he does is he does it in a way that just helps us slowly become more comfortable in the presence of God. And now down to verse 13. Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring unending, he's implying, of water that will well up to eternal life. And this obviously captures her interest. She says to him, she says, sir, give me the water that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. See, she's asking for something. This is what she's getting from God. Because we are living beings. We need to take in water every day. Because our body is majority made up of water, right? See, Jesus is, is asking for a glass of water. Because he's thirsty. But what he's offering in return is not an equal balance. It's not an equal exchange. He says, I will give you something that is so much more than you can comprehend. I will give you a living well inside of you that is unending that will give you eternal life. See, what this is, now I'm, I'm, I'm going a little vague here, a little, little off the reservation maybe, but this is, this is what worship is, people. When we have a relationship with God and, we, and he's asking us to worship him, he's not some ignorant 
tyrant that says, I'm so insecure unless you sing my songs. Please do it. Please do it. He's not like that. See, Jesus is asking us for a glass of water. Why? Because we are in relationship with the living, risen God. Amen? And he says, if you give me something that I require, I desire, I don't need it. But I desire it from you because I love you and I want to be in relationship with you. I'm going to give you something so much greater back. And it's not an equal, it's not even a barter system where you're buying salvation. It's a relationship. And he says, I just want a little that you can give me and I want to give you all that I can give you, which is so much more than you could ever give me. But it's not about earning it. It's about grace. I want to be in relationship. I want to give you this water. Whew. And here's something interesting too. I did a little digging. The symbolism of water as the source of life and youth is closely linked not just to the Old Testament but to every cult and religion of the Middle East in the language that they use. Especially where God himself is called the source of living water in Genesis 26, in Jeremiah 2, in Jeremiah 17, in Psalm 36. God is called the water of living life. And here is a man standing in front of her talking about it as something that can actually be obtained rather than just this religious concept. So it's got her attention because she says, well, first of all, you aren't demeaning me at all like I'm used to. And second of all, you're trying to build me up and saying I should be getting more from God. But then she kind of goes into it. She just says, it kind of has like a bit of her doubts. But this is where it takes a very interesting turn. Jesus seems to, you know, complete U-turn here. Verse 16. He told her, go call your husband and come back. Go get him. Go get your husband come back and we'll talk. And she, well, okay, I, I guess. But she, verse 17, she says, I have no husband. She replied, Jesus says to her, you are right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you have had five husbands. And the man you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Now, why do I want to stop here? There's a lot of times we want to stop. And when Jesus comes into our life and says, I'm going to give you everything that you've ever desired. And, and God almost becomes, at times, unintentionally like a genie. I just, yeah, just come to Christ, rub the lamp tithe on Sunday, whoo! Yeah. And if it's not working, give more because it's your fault. <laughs> no! That's not what's being said here, but it's funny how God actually steps in and he addresses something that's so needed in her life. See, every relationship that she's had with a man has been unhealthy or has been unfulfilling or has had consequences or has had different connotations that haven't been positive. I don't know if she had five husbands that died, or maybe five husbands that left, or maybe she just didn't have the capacity to be able to trust in a marriage relationship five times over that she was divorced five times to the point where the sixth man, she's like, screw marriage, I'm done. And you know what? Fair enough. If at first you don't succeed five times and then just quit. I guess, I don't know. Now she's got a guy on the side that Jesus just calls us. Like, and now you've got a booty call to fulfill your every sexual need and desire. You're trying to find arm's length intimacy with a man. But what you don't understand is that what I'm offering you is a relationship with God who's going to show you what a real man should actually be like and will love you unending and won't let you down, leave, or die on you. That is why it's brought up here. But a lot of times we get uncomfortable because God is going to bring up something in our life when we just step into his presence. He says, this has defined you far too long. And you've tried to hide it from everyone, including me, but no more. No more brokenness of your past identifying you today and tomorrow. It is me and my love for you. My living well cannot be quenched or shut off by some brokenness before you've allowed to identify you. You are mine. I love you. Let's deal with this. Now, you got to understand, there's, this is a lot to take in for this woman in one sitting, where she's just going to get water. But isn't that the way God works when he shows up? Surprises the heck out of us, blows us on our backsides, and we're like, what? But that's the work of God. Boom, it can be instant, it can be a journey, it can be whatever, but God will show up. Notice also that he doesn't condemn her. This is, this is the same 
same rabbi, the same Jewish man who didn't condemn the woman caught in adultery either. When the law and the religion said they should die. Right? No, he loves her. He sees beyond that because everyone's got a backstory. Even as Chantel was sharing this morning, this, this, this guy who's in his 30s who died of an overdose. He was my literal neighbor, by the way, down the street from me. So it strikes home a little bit. You know, I didn't know him. I never spoke to him. I saw him drive really fast up and down the street, and I gave him one of these looks as a dad. You know. I don't, I don't know where this comes from, but all of a sudden you have kids, and the wrist just cocks out. You can't grab your hips anymore. You do this. Like an African-American woman who's doing, what? Mm -mm. Like just, what? I don't know where that came from. I've never done that before, but I have kids. Eh, slow down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. He always told me I was number one. So we had a bit of a connection. <laughs> but the thing is, though, is that what people don't realize, and I don't care who it is, I think our society is so quick to marginalize and compartmentalize people who are in addiction. See, he grew up in a home with addiction. This was learned behavior from childhood. This is what my parents do. This is what I will start doing. Why? Because not only are they teaching me, it's an escape from my reality. But we're so, oh, those, those blah, 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 they should get off drugs. It's like, yeah, but if drugs is the only time they find peace and that's all they know, you can't just tell them to stop. They need a well experience. They need love, not condemnation from afar. I've lost my spot. There it is, 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Because he just spoke into her life things he couldn't possibly know. But he spoke into it with direction, with intention and purpose and love. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. And that's a place I can't go. Because I'm a half-breed. Because I'm condemned. I'm an outsider. I'm, I can't go there. So basically what you're telling me is I'm not good enough to worship God and I'm not allowed to worship God because I don't meet your standards. So what am I going to do? Jesus says, Nip! Nine! Woman! And I love this. When Jesus says woman, it's never like, Woman! It's like, woman. You know, it's that kind of a calmer. Woman, woman. It's almost like an Elvis. Like, huh, woman. You know. Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do not know. For salvation is from the Jews, but it's also from God. Yet a time is coming, and now has come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. What I love about this is that Jesus is speaking to worship as a heart attitude, more than the limits of religious structures and sacred places. What I mean, it's not about buildings. It's about God. It's not about a place. It's about the Holy Spirit. It's not about a building. It's the heart of worship. That's why we sing the song, I'm coming back to the heart of worship, now I'm coming back to the place of worship. Because it's about the connection with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Not with the words, not even with a place. It's about God being present and us being in His presence. And the woman said, I know that the Messiah called the Christ is coming. And when He comes, He will explain everything to us. What she is saying is that hope is coming for me. Because I right now am no more than an outcast. And Jesus declared, I am the one. I am the one speaking to you. I am he. This is one of the first times Jesus reveals and even calls himself the Messiah. And it's not to the religious elite or quote unquote culturally deserving to hear that message in Jerusalem. It's in a place he shouldn't have been as a Jew. That means Jesus is going for everybody. He isn't here just to save the already saved. He's here for everyone 
John 3:16 for God so loved the world which can be translated into everyone that has been that will be and everyone in between regardless of background I love you I died for you even if you didn't know me not because you've earned it or deserved it because I love you and you have value and all you have to do is say yes I receive It's interesting, too, when you look at the symbolism. In Ezekiel 47, according to which a source of water would well up from the temple at the end of time. And in John 7, Jesus presents himself as the Christ and the living temple from which the living waters flow and follows the same Line. It's the whole purpose of Jesus. He says, there's something coming that will bring life. I'm not here to bring converts to religion. I'm here to bring people into the presence of God. And there's a big difference. And it's so interesting, too, that the reason that, that this, this happened at a well is so interesting. Again, if you were in the culture 2,000 years ago, you would get this right away, but... I just Google it, like, what, what is the significance of a well? And this is what I came up with. It was at the well, Abraham's servant met Rebekah, Isaac's future wife, in Genesis 24. And it was at a well that Jacob met Rachel in Genesis 29. And that Moses met his future wife in Exodus 2, offering himself as... And <laughs> Here's Jesus. Talking to a woman who has not been able to find fulfillment, completion, or love without, oh, what is the word? I'm losing it now. Find love that, 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 that doesn't end in five marriages. And the sixth one, she doesn't even bother getting married to. She's just, you know, jacked up, living, living, living life. They're love buddies from afar, right? They text each other. I don't know. But isn't it interesting that the well represented marriage and unity, and Jesus is saying to this woman, I know you, I see you, I want you to be married, chained, in a relationship that you didn't know could even exist till now. And isn't it interesting that he is the seventh man? And isn't it interesting in the Bible that the seven, the, 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 the meaning of seven, especially as it pertains to God, means complete perfection. I want to be your seventh husband that I will never let you down. And I don't mean literally. But I want to be what you've been looking for and haven't been able to find in other people. I want to be that completion, that wholeness, that dedication, that perfection in your life. Why is that pertinent to us? Because when we are broken and when Jesus steps into our life time and time again, he says, I want to be that for you. And maybe you've walked away or maybe you've tried to find that in other relationships with other people. Or maybe it's been the dating game or the marriage game or something else. Something has distracted you from me. I'm back. I'm here. I never left. I want you back for me and I will always be there and I will always be that for you. I love you. I value you. I will lift you up, not tear you down. Why? Why? Because he had to go through Samaria. Nothing was going to stop him from getting to her. And next week we're going to see what happens after that. But for this week, Jesus is going to go through Samaria. And sometimes he's even going to go through, through hell for you. Jesus, here, I want you to picture this, because every time we're stuck in the middle of something that is so overwhelming and hard and difficult, it grabs us. But keep in mind, if you're in the middle of it, that means there's a perimeter to it. And Jesus is outside of it, for starters, okay? So he's bigger than our problems. Second of all, he chooses to meet us in the middle, which means he had to get to us in the middle, which means he wades through our garbage, our crap, our pains, our sufferings, even if it's self-imposed, to get to us. And he says, you are more than this. You are mine. You've always been mine. I love you. Will you come with me? So what do we say this morning? Are we going to go with Christ? Who are we?
We're sons and daughters of the king. And not because we earn or deserve it or we're good enough to say, I am this, because he gave it to us first. And all we have to say is, yes, I receive. Thank you for grace undeserved that you forgave me, you loved me, and accept me time and time again, especially when I don't deserve it. And he says, I've always met you in the middle. You just have to reach out and see me. Let me reveal myself to you time and time and time and time again. God, thank you so much that you love us, that you're so willing to wade through all the stuff to get to us, Lord, if it's the first time or the millionth time. You say, we have value because you love us. Just that simple. Jesus, and I just pray for a change in everyone's life time and time again, that no matter what it is, no matter what it is we have gone through or are going through, if we're in a good spot, a bad spot, whatever, that we will continuously be the person at the well that is absolutely blown away through revelations time and time again of how much you love us. Lord, that even when you ask us for something as simple as will you give me worship because we're in a relationship and it's a two-way street, I want you to love me, but just wait for the wave of love and things I'm going to give you right back because I'm going to give you a well that is unending, that's going to lead you to eternal life. That my spirit will come upon you, the same spirit that breathed life into all existence in the beginning in Genesis. The same spirit that came upon Jesus and enabled him to do his ministry and his miracles and everything and raise the dead and be raised himself, I'm going to give it to you. And that is not a spirit that can be tamed. It is a wild beast that consumes. It will never stop pursuing you and will just ravage your entire life in a good way. I want to be mauled by the spirit of God. That should be on a shirt. But it's not something that we can just let out of the box on Sunday mornings. God, I pray for an absolute change for myself and everyone in this room and everyone who's a part of this body who can't be here, that your spirit will come upon us so heavy, so thick, and so ferociously, Lord, that we not only cannot ignore it, we can't help but be changed by it. Lord, and blow us away daily monthly, weekly. God, if we're mourning and grieving, Lord, I pray for peace. I pray for joy. I pray for a newness in who we are, Lord. And I pray that you will come against anything that will try and slow down what you are doing in our life or distract our vision from you that we will be Peter out of the boat gazing at you, not Peter looking down and sinking, Lord. But even if we are, all we have to do is reach up and there you are to pull us up. So thank you, God. Amen. 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 <clears throat>